Recently, I took a few minutes to create a list of all the major things I've done professionally in 2022. While the list was relatively long and I felt a certain amount of pride and reflection, something was just a little off. I tried to recall how I felt at the time each project was being created. Did I enjoy the process? How much stress or pressure was involved in each? In short, reflecting not on what I had done, but how I had been. I've been thinking a lot lately about this tension between doing and being. As a culture, we seem to have a daily bias on the former, while the latter gets relegated to the occasional reflection. For example, how many of us create to-do lists? Many, I would assume. Now, how many have ever created a to-be list? Our days are filled with the conscious decisions of to-do or not to-do. Forgetting that Shakespeare famously told us to be or not to be, that is the question. While there is often a chicken or egg aspect when it comes to doing versus being, are we the sum of what we've done, or does our true being drive the quality of what we produce? Hamlet's soliloquy seems to provide this answer. Can you imagine how much more trivial this whole speech would have been if it began with to do or not to do? If one wants to create something that makes a difference, the first step is not to write down a list of things to do that day. Rather, it is to be present both in our own minds and with those whose lives we want to make a difference in. From that fertile ground, inspiration springs. Those of us who are parents are often overwhelmed with lists of things we need to do each day for our children, taking them to practice, going to the store, making their meals, planning social events, and on and on and on. But isn't the first step of being a parent simply being truly present for our child? That's a much harder task when we're running around all day like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to get as much done as we can. The same holds true for almost any role we play in our lives. By its simplest definition, being is about how we exist in the world, the essence of ourselves that we bring into every interaction with others and ourselves. So how are you being lately? I made this list because the end of the year was approaching, and I wanted to check in on how I was doing. By that measure, I guess okay. But in thinking about how I'd like to spend this year, I want to try to focus on simply being. I have a hunch that I'll feel more joy and satisfaction with whatever that produces, as well as those around me. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with Dr. Deepak Chopra, whose new book, Living in the Light, was written with Sarah Platt Fingerwith. In our conversation, we talk about this juxtaposition of being versus doing, our journeys to self-realization, and what it means to live in the light. While we discuss some heady stuff, it was a free-flowing and down-to-earth conversation, one I hope you find enlightening. As you listen, you may notice the occasional background jingling noise caused by moving jewelry. My apologies for any distraction it may cause. Now on to our conversation. I'd like to start from the beginning. It's interesting that in the end of your new book, which is called Living in the Light, you talk about where do we go from here as an evolution. And I'd like to talk about your own evolution in to, to start, which began in a very, I guess, traditional sense. Your father was a doctor, you um, trained to be a doctor, your brother was a doctor. And I'm wondering what was happening in the Chopra household where healing and traditional medicine, I think in the beginning, were really centerpieces of, of growing up. Yeah, my father was not only a doctor, he was a very famous doctor. He was a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. And at one time, he was a cardiologist to the Queen, who just passed away at the Royal Mm. Heart Hospital in London. He was also one of the first people to identify high-altitude heart disease or mountain sickness. When the Chinese and Indians were at war, he landed a plane in Leh in Tibet. And while they were shooting each other, he was measuring cardiac pressures and describing the sickness we now know Mm. as high-altitude pulmonary edema and so on. So, I was brought up with the idea that medicine is a very romantic (laughs) occupation (laughs) and, you know, you get to be a hero if you're a doctor and you save lives and all of that. And 
that, you know, the usual things we talk about, medicine, noble profession, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which it is. And that's still my background. I mean, many people call me a witch doctor now, but that's besides the point. I still have a license to practice medicine in Massachusetts, California, and Florida, and getting a new license in uh, New York. And I have uh, faculty appointments at various medical schools, including uh, Mount Sinai in New York, University of California in San Diego, and University of Central Florida, where I teach medical students. So I think I'm still a doctor. Yeah, well, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree. I, it's interesting, several years ago, I, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but I got to spend all the time with Dr. Amit Sood, who at the time was at the Mayo Clinic um, running their mind-body practice. And he told a story about his journey, which it, it started in sort of traditional medicine. And he one of his formative experiences was helping people in the aftermath of the Bhopal gas tragedy and seeing just incredible human suffering. And then when he came here to do his residency, he saw suffering of a different type, less sort of physical, more mental. And he really struggled with people who just seemed to be walking around, generally physically appearing to be fine with a lot, generally decent amount of resources, but he couldn't get past the suffering that he saw and the stress that people were feeling, which led to his, you know, sort of movement more towards the practicing medicine of the mind, I guess you would say. And I'm wondering, was there any similar epiphany or moment in your life where you saw that the way to make a difference was not in the spirit of the traditional medicine that you mentioned that your father was practicing, but in this sort of different path that you've now been on a journey for the last 50 plus years, I guess? Yeah, Bob, there were several reasons for my personal transformation. One was that uh, in my residency, I was very stressed myself. Mm. I was smoking cigarettes and, uh, frankly speaking, getting drunk on weekends to manage my stress. <laughs> and I remember one day actually putting a pacemaker uh, in a patient, putting him on a ventilator at a Harvard hospital, and then going outside the hospital to smoke a cigarette and mm. feeling a great deal of disgust. I actually I remember the exact moment when I threw away my cigarette and tossed away my whiskey for the rest of my life. This was in, in the late 1970s. At the same time, I was actually working with one of the most eminent neuroendocrinologists in the world, who was then the president of the Endocrine Society, a person by the name of Seymour Reichlin. He's now 97, by the way, and in amazingly good health. He lives in Arizona and he still comes to NYU every year to do a sabbatical. He teaches, mm -hmm. argues with me <laughs> about consciousness. If he finds a snake in his garden, he dissects the brain to look for neuropeptides. So when I was actually training with him, one day a colleague of mine who later went on to become the chief of brain chemistry at the NIH, Candice Pert, she made a remark. We were looking at these molecules, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, opiates, and she said, these are the molecules of emotion. And that clicked in my mm. mind. I said, why don't you write a book called Mole Molecules of Emotion? She said, I'll do that if you write the foreword, which I did. And, you know, she became very famous, as I said. And she was also the discoverer of what we now called the opioid receptor, the receptor in the brain that tags on to opiates. And, you know, opiates are the number one cause of addiction right now in our country. And so it clicked in me that, you know, this division between mind and body was artificial. Wherever a thought goes um, or an emotion goes, a molecule follows and vice versa. That there's no mental event that doesn't have a physical correlate and vice versa. There's no... So why do we call these two separate things? There, you know, the mind is a subjective experience or in consciousness, and the body is an objective experience in consciousness, and they both correlate with each other. So that was how I transitioned, first thinking there's a mind-body connection, then realizing mind and body are inseparable and entangled, and now looking at uh, what is consciousness. If uh, the mind and body are parallel activities in our awareness, 
where is that and mm. what is that what is it that knows the mind what is it that knows the body what is it that knows the emotions and that's today called the hard problem of consciousness if you google the following question what are the 125 open questions in science the number one open question is what's the universe made of now without going into detail everybody agrees that the universe is made of nothing and the second open question is uh, what's the biological basis of consciousness and uh, how does the brain produce experience and i think they're both the wrong questions and hence the book living in the light because right now we assume that molecules and atoms and force fields somehow created the brain and in turn the brain created the experience well the brain doesn't record any experience if i put a knife through your brain you won't feel a thing there's no color there's no sound there's no texture there's no sensation in the brain itself all there are are what are called biological correlates electrochemicals so how do electrochemicals produce insight and intuition and choice and imagination and feeling and yearning and longing and self reflection and transcendence mm. i think it's a ridiculous question the chemicals themselves and force fields human constructs for experiences in consciousness so is the body so mm. it's been a long journey but it's been very gradual first the mind body connection then there's no mind body connection they're inseparably one then there are parallel activities of consciousness and then actually everything that we call the universe is consciousness because we experience it in awareness as what as sensations perceptions images feelings and thoughts the rest is a human story Yeah, I want I want to get to that to more about the book and the idea of self actualization in a second. But when you think and I, I I agree with what you're saying before that there we often certainly in this culture pit things against each other. You know, it's this or that. We don't do sort of nuances and and connection as well as maybe we would like. But I do wonder how you would describe the limits of mind and body in the context of both suffering and the overcoming of it that construction is from a, a quote from Helen Keller who once said the world is full of suffering and also the the overcoming of it which has always stuck with me and we live in a world where unfortunately there's too much suffering and some of it is is of a physical variety some of it is you know stress and 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 mental and for those people who sort of pit mind and body against each other how do you describe the role that they play in the context of acknowledging suffering and trying to move towards you know healing or the overcoming of it now that i'm over the years become partial to eastern wisdom traditions mm -hmm. and uh, what they say about human suffering i think um, all of them agree whether it's buddhist or vedantic or any of the non dual thinkers of philosophy in the east they say suffering human suffering especially existential suffering comes from the classic things like old the fear of old age infirmity mm. death a clinging and grasping recoiling and grasping is that which is transient and ephem ephemeral and impermanent and dreamlike of identifying with our ego instead of our true self and the fear of death that's the, that's what is existential suffering and the fact that we have physical pain is also very different from the physical pain that um, say other species per se have in the moment uh, we actually perpetuate our physical pain with the construct of pain itself mm. the pain pathways in the brain and in our nervous system of existential mental suffering and physical pain are the same and you know all pain comes from trauma and uh, or the memory of trauma and there's no one that hasn't experienced trauma in their birth in their childhood in their growing up years there's always been some kind of trauma uh, either physical trauma or emotional trauma or even lack of self esteem so we are traumatized at birth we are traumatized in teenage years 
we are frequently traumatized in uh, childhood. And what we call anger is the memory of trauma. Hostility is the desire to get even. Fear is the anticipation of trauma. Guilt and shame is blaming yourself. And depression is kind of a depletion of energy as a result of all of the above that I just stated. And therefore, it's, it's universal. Suffering is universal. Uh, human suffering is universal. And it also comes from the misinterpretation of our identity as the separate self. And when we transcend the separate self and experience a unified wholeness, then suddenly it all disappears. But before that, we all also encounter mm. what is called the dark night of the soul when we recognize that every identity we have assumed is provisional and not real. So would you say, though, in terms of the the trauma, which, you know, sometimes is, is very sort of physical in nature, is that the sort of the traditional Western interventions, the, oh, someone's having a heart attack, we need to make sure that they don't die, those kinds of traumatic physical realities are where a lot of traditional medicine in the healing of the body makes, you know, appropriate sense. But it's yes. the aftermath of that in terms of how we choose to recover from that where the mind can really play a, an important role. Absolutely true. So, you know, modern interventional medicine or mechanistic medicine, as we want to call it, is extremely effective in acute trauma and acute mm -hmm. injury and acute illness. If you have uh, break your bone, you need an orthopedic surgeon. You have pneumonia, you need an antibiotic. If you have a, a heart attack imminent coming and, uh, you know, angioplasty and surgery could save your life in the moment. But mm. then when you want to address the long-term chronic afflictions we have, you need a more integrative approach that addresses everything, you know, yeah. your personal interactions, your relationships, your social environment, what you eat, how do you sleep, all of that matters. So moving on to the new book, it was interesting timing. When I first connected with uh, members of your publisher's team at Penguin, my oldest daughter, coincidentally, in her social studies unit, had just gone through studying the four yogas, and including Raha Royal Yoga. So it was interesting timing on that end. In another interview, I heard you describe this as, you know, there's the, the, the reality of the world as we sort of see it. And then there's the way in which we interpret it sort of underneath the surface, a sort of a sub layer. And I wonder if you could just maybe comment on, you know, I'm not going to say that we as a society are superficial by and large, but maybe, maybe we are, and we don't seem to spend a lot of time in self reflection. And I'm wondering, was there something about the timing of this book that was commiserate with where we are as a society, or is it where you were in terms of your own journey? I think where I was in my own journey is more accurate, although, you know, I've watched the evolution of yoga in this country now for 35, 40 years. And so when I first came into this to this country in 1970, I've been here that long. You know, I've mm. spent my life mostly in America, even though I went to medical school. I came here at the age of 23, and now I'm 76. So when I first came, uh, and I walked in New York City, there was hardly a yoga studio. Now there's mm. a yoga studio every block. And I have watched the evolution of American yoga, if I might call it that. It started off with, oh, this is a wonderful way to exercise. Mm. It's a wonderful way to stretch. It's a wonderful way to feel. It's a wonderful way to improve how you look, to improve your stamina, to lose weight. Uh, on and on. Then, you know, we started understanding that yoga stimulates the vagus nerve and the body postures, the yoga asanas, as we call them, they're actually seeds of awareness. You're bringing awareness mm. into the body. And then slowly, some people realize that the body, in fact, is made of awareness. It's an uh, experience in awareness. The body is an experience in consciousness that arises in consciousness, is known in consciousness, and made of the perceptual activity that we call consciousness. So that slowly got people into asking, not everyone, what is reality? Mm. And even though they were totally entrenched in the world of physical aspects of yoga, or which we call 
Hatha Yoga. Yoga, the word means union. Uh, it comes from the in, uh, word yuj in Sanskrit, which is related to the English word yoke. When Jesus says, my yoke mm. is easy, my burden is light because I'm connected to the source. Of course, he uses his metaphor of that time, the father or God is the source. But in yogic traditions, the source of all experience is consciousness. And once you get in touch with pure consciousness, which is beyond the conditioned mind, then you're liberated from suffering. And these eight limbs of yoga, the royal yoga, are actually the complete yoga. So, you know, yama and niyama are principles of emotion, social and emotional intelligence. Yoga asana, the physical practice, is to understand the body as a modified form of awareness or consciousness. Pranayam or breathing, manipulation of breath, is to control the autonomic nervous system. Pratyahara, which is withdrawal of the senses and now also called interoceptive awareness, is training yourself to regulate your autonomic nervous system, particularly the vagus nerve, which counteracts sympathetic overdrive. And then the last three limbs, dharna, focused attention and intention, dhyan, samadhi, meditation, and samadhi, transcendence, they actually are the last three ladders which we climb on our path to self-actualization or liberation. So living in the light is actually uh, a practical explanation of these eight limbs of yoga. And they are part of, as you said, Royal Yoga, Raj Yoga, which is then one of the four yogas, Karma Yoga, which is action with love, love with action as the only motivation. Gyan Yoga, the yoga of the intellect, how we use the intellect to go beyond the intellect because the intellect is based on an artificial subject-object split. In nature, subject and object are both the same manifestations of consciousness. So Gyan Yoga is the razor's edge. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then there's the yoga of love, which is called bhakti yoga. And they're all actually a complete science in themselves to understand that reality is not what we perceive. Reality is that which is the source of all perception and mm -hmm. cognition. Is the way in which you saw yoga being practiced in, in the United States is like a you know good and healthy way to exercise, but maybe not going to the, to the next uh, level. I, I was wondering if there's a, a parallel structure there, like similar to your earlier story where you would perform surgery on someone, but then go out and have a cigarette, whether you'd see someone take a yoga class and then come out and yell at someone for cutting in front of them, you know, or, yes. or something along those lines. So, yes, exactly. Exactly. But yoga evolved in the same way, in a collective yeah. consciousness. Yes. Yeah. And so, so rather than being something that's transactional, to sort of evolving to an ongoing way of being, where the way in which we think about yoga in terms of different poses and stuff like that, they're simply just a conduit to allow for more, you know, self-reflection and self-actualization. Yes, Bob. You know, I also noticed that when people go to yoga classes, they're in kind of in a hurry. Get to the class, do it, mm. and leave. When, in fact, the whole purpose of that class and even the postures are to rest in that awareness, mm. to actually take your time and enjoy the journey then rather hoping for an outcome, like you said, transactional. It is it's the joy of the experience of transcendence that brings people back to yoga all the time. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from the WNET Group reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. Now back to the show. Sometimes we find ourselves doing things and we don't question why we're doing them or, you know, what am I getting out of this? And it reminds me, I was reading earlier that I think your daughter had noted that growing up there, you know, you would consistently ask, I think, four different questions. One was, who am I? Mm -hmm. What do I want? How do I serve and, and what am I grateful for? And 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the importance of us creating the space to ask questions of ourselves so it can lead us to, to discovery in terms of what our purpose is or why we're here or how we're connected to others. Reflective inquiry or self-inquiry has been a part of contemplative traditions, East and West, for thousands of years. Right now, because we are so bamboozled by technology and the internet and media, that our direction of awareness is always directed at the so-called external world. And we seek satisfaction by achieving something in the external world. So it's always action-oriented. When in reality, our experience of existence be begins with being. Being is the first experience we have, even as children. It is a moment when we become aware that we exist. And so being is fundamental. Then feeling arises. Feeling is sensation and you know, just it's basically sensory experience that we feel in our body. Feeling leads to thinking. Unfortunately, thinking is very dogmatic instead of reflective. Mm. You know, dogmatic thinking is what creates the divided, separate mind. Reflective thinking actually takes you to a much deeper level. And then thinking is followed by speaking, and speaking is followed by action. That would be the normal sequence. We've got it the other way mm. around. We are constantly doing, then we speak about what we are doing. <laughs> we have very dogmatic ideas about <laughs> why we are doing what we're doing is the right thing to do. And there is no time for being. Yeah. So you mentioned this sort of a uh, this idea the focus on the the external world versus the internal and distractions that come with that. You had written something, I think it was a few years ago, uh, called the the New American Dream. And mm -hmm. some people would look at you and your journey and see it as exemplar in terms of being able to come here. And, you know, obviously your parents were, you know, did quite well in India, but you came here and have achieved a level of success that's pretty extraordinary. And your your children are similarly on a path. And people might look at that and say, wow, that's that's the American dream. Look what he's been able to do because he thought he could do it and he put his mind to it. And I guess the, there's some, you know, most versions of success have ego attached to it. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think a recalibration of the American dream would look like. Yeah, so actually when I came to this country, uh, Bob, because of various rules and regulations, including foreign exchange regulations and other regulations and, you know, rules, I didn't have any money when I came to this country, mm -hmm. zero. I, in fact, I had to make a collect call just to get a ride to the hospital that I was going to work in. So I started my American so-called dream with zero dollars. Mm. The only thing I had was a good education, thanks mm. to my parents. And the rest uh, happened kind of spontaneously, uh, hard work, I would say, driving ambition uh, at that time, and a lot of stress. So <laughs> driving ambition, the hard work, exacting plans, stress went together. Mm. Uh, all of them went together. The recalibration was much later during my fellowship and my early years in practice when I realized that you know, if, if you didn't have joy in your life, what was the point? I mean, if I, if I made, let's say, lots of money, had the best health in the world, was the most important person in my profession, but I didn't have joy, I had wasted my life. So mm. I recalibrated uh, joy is the only measure of success and joy is the only measure of well-being. And then redefine success, at least for me, as the progressive realization of worthy goals, but also the ability to love, have compassion, and most importantly, to try and figure out who am I? Am I the changing body? or the awareness in which the changing body is an experience? Am I the changing mind, or am I the awareness in which the changing mind is an experience? Am I the experience of the world, or even the world is a changing experience in my awareness? And these questions led me to other important questions. What's my purpose? How do I serve? What do I really want? And finally, you know, the ultimate question is, what am I grateful for? When the more I ask myself this question, the more I realize I'm grateful for the mere fact that I exist. That I mm. exist is a perpetual surprise. Yeah. I mean, 
we are not shocked by our existence our life is wasted yeah i mean one of my one of my favorite poems is uh what women's owe me o life and That's the beautiful. opening verse is you know as you probably remember is is sort of like this litany of things that aren't good about the world and it ends with oh me oh life what amongst this your question of recurring what is the purpose and it says the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse and uh, that's a i think a, a wonderful way to think about legacy and, and purpose the name of the show is attribution and the reason why is that when i talk and think about questions of the american dream and success and what contributes to it you know years ago i came across um, a bias that is commonplace at least in the united states called fundamental attribution error which it is this notion that we generally overemphasize our own agency in the world and underestimate the environment in which we live. And for context, I grew up in the United States in right outside of Boston and Chelsea, home of Horatio Alger, and didn't have a lot of resources, single mom, three kids, a lot of trauma uh, during that period of time, and saw a certain degree of success. And people would attribute my own success, my own story to like, wow, you really worked hard, you overcame things. And I knew that while hard work was important, it wasn't the only thing. Because I could point to people in my life who worked just as hard, if not harder than I did, tending bar, driving truck, you know, on the factory lines, and had different kinds of outcomes. And, and so this question of attribution and what we attribute our success to, um, and this tension between wanting to acknowledge our own agency, because without it, we feel hopeless, but also to acknowledge and be grateful for those who have helped us along the way, I think is something that a lot of people maybe struggle with. And I wonder if in the context of your work, you know, what you see in terms of people's ways in which they think about their own life and what drives it and that relationship between their own agency and everything else in the world. Bob, as I've looked at um, studies on self-actualized people, one of the things that they experience is loss of agency. Mm. Uh, it's all a divine mystery. And uh, I think if you have that attitude of extreme gratitude and even bewilderment, you know, as what mm. his name uh, Rumi said, exchange your cleverness for bewilderment. Because uh, ultimately, there's no answer to the mystery of our existence. You can make <laughs> up anything, you know, God, Big Bang, all of that. There's no explanation for why we exist. And even more mysterious is the awareness that we exist. So, you know, there's existence, but there's also awareness of existence. They go along together. If you're not aware of existence, then there's no existence. Non-existence is not an experience. So, and also, if existence is non-local or outside of space-time, and what we call the theater of space-time and causality is a projection, then in fact, uh, the best way to deal with life is through intention and choiceless awareness. But it takes a long time to get there. I struggled mm. with it myself. Driving ambition, addiction, attachment, preference, intention, subtle intention. And finally, I realized that actually the whole universe is effortlessly evolving. You know, in every seed is the promise of thousands of forests, and nature functions with effortless spontaneity. If I can function with no regrets, no anticipation, and being present to this moment, actually it's ecstatic. Mm. But I'm always thinking about the future or the past, you know. So once, you know, I was talking to an Indian sage a long time ago, and, you know, we were talking about stress, and he had never experienced something like that. He was a monk in India, in the mountains, and I had gone to see him because I was very fascinated by somebody who lived like that in reclusiveness. And he asked me, what is this thing that people call stress? And I said, it's called the perception <laughs> of threat. He said, the perception of what? I said, threat. And he kind of paused for a moment and said to me, you mean resistance to existence? And mm. I really love that remark. Resistance to existence is what we all have. And then we, we try to solve it by more resistance to existence. 
Yeah, that's a, a great framing. I do, you said something earlier, this notion of, uh, you know, having it sort of backwards where we focus so much on the doing, right? As instead of being at the other uh, end of the uh, spectrum. And it reminded me of something I heard you say previously where someone asked you, what was the best thing you've heard recently? And you, your answer was silence, which I think, uh, I mean, it hit home because some people just don't feel comfortable sitting in silence. They need to sort of fill the space or, you know, and it seems like uh, sitting in silence is, is, is by definition being present. Yeah. Sitting in silence is, you know, what Rumi said, God's language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. So uh, these days before I sleep, I sit in silence and even, uh, you know, kind of reflect on my next chapter, I'm 76, so the next chapter has to be death, <laughs> you know. So I reflect <laughs> on that, and, you know, I realize that I came alone, and I'm going to leave alone, and I better be comfortable by uh, being alone, because, you know, solitude is very different than loneliness. Solitude is when you really connect. Loneliness mm. is an activity of the mind. It's interesting, this is going to sound like a not a morbid thought, but I think an interesting one. Years ago, I had the privilege to be uh, present in my grandmother's final days. And I was really close to her. And I remember at some point she had your family gathered around her and she's already, and it's like, you talk about, you know, you hear these stories about people who need to feel peace in order to sort of let go. And she sat around and she said, I think I'm, I think I'm ready. And everyone held oh, their right. hands and it was so beautiful. And then a couple seconds had passed and her daughter, my aunt yelled, mommy, don't go. Oh. And all of a sudden, two seconds passed, and my grandmother's eyes opened up and looked at everyone, and she said, am I dead? <laughs> she, Because her moment of peace had been sort of broken there for a moment, and she you know, ultimately passed a short while thereafter. But it was this idea of, of you know, being able to, even in your last moment, sit in the silence and be present in that and feel comfort in the life that you've lived, right, and be at peace with that. That's a beautiful story, Bob. I don't know what to say because other than the fact that what we call peace of mind is an oxymoron. You can't have peace of mind at the same time. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so you'd have to go to that level of silence if you want peace. It's remarkable to hear because I've heard you say it in terms of like, do you feel stress? And it seems as if you don't feel much of it anymore. And I'm sure that is not something that's just a singular conscious decision, but a, a lifetime of practice, right? It is a lifetime. And, and, I, and I wonder, obviously your book is, is about this. It's about sort of trying to give some very practical tips for how to move about this world with a greater sense of self-realization and certain tools that may um, help you, particularly when you are feeling you know, moments of stress or other kinds of ill feelings that we've discussed here, fear, et cetera. And I'm wondering if there's any, as we, you know, we're taping this towards the end of the year, a time where there is natural reflection, if there are any specific tools or practices that have been particularly helpful for you during a difficult time. As you said, Bob, it's been a lifetime mm, of yeah. learning and evolution. And one thing I'm grateful for, actually, is being a physician. Mm. Now, I've worked in emergency rooms, I've worked in ICUs. I've seen a lot of suffering. I've seen people die by the hour. Mm. And, you know, what happens in, uh, in the medical profession is we get immune to it because, in fact, we almost get into denial of the fact of how much suffering there is. And mm. we do deny our own suffering. And in that denial, we become biological robots, even as so-called healers in the medical profession. Mm. So I saw suffering, my own. I saw the suffering of people who were ill. I saw the suffering of their relatives. And I realized that, you know, it wasn't enough to be a superb technician who knew everything about the human body and nothing about the human spirit and nothing about what we call a human being. Mm. only about the human doing part of it. And so I found my peace by just asking myself, how could I participate even to a minuscule event in the alleviation of human suffering? Because every time I alleviated it, even a little bit, 
I felt better. Mm. You know, it was so interesting yeah. that when you help somebody else go beyond their suffering, your own your own suffering decreases. Mm. No doubt. I think another thing, at least I've I've taken great comfort in, is when you acknowledge the people who have eliminated or alleviated your suffering, when you are able to, you know, remind them of something that they've done for you, it can lift them up at a difficult time or inspire us to want to be continually in service of others. And I, I end each show with a very sort of similar uh, conceit, which is, you know, every show has its credits where, you know, you talk about who produced it and the music and things like that. But I like to cede that time to my guest who has been kind enough to join me and allow them to say out loud the names of people who have helped them away along the way, whether it was the alleviation of suffering or the providing of an opportunity. And obviously you could name some very well-known names, you know, uh, Oprah Winfrey among them and whatnot, but there's maybe some people that no listener would know who it was, but I believe the saying of their name aloud is an important ritual that at least I, I take some solace in on this show. So I, I wonder if you'd like to, uh, with the caveat that it's not meant to be a complete, uh, a completely exhaustive list of people <laughs> you feel grateful for. No, so here we go. I would like to express my gratitude to my parents, Krishan Chopra and Pushpa Chopra, who actually taught me how to reflect and ask deep questions and try to figure out who I am. And then I want to acknowledge my children, Gautam Chopra and Malika Chopra, for calling me out every time I was a cunning hypocrite and <laughs> pretending to be who I was not. That's enough. <laughs> That's wonderful. I recently saw some of your uh, your son's uh, documentary, which I thought was a, a loving and honest uh, uh, tribute, which is wonderful. Yeah, it helped me a lot. Well, thank you so much for, for not only appearing on the show today, but for all that you do to try to just help people along their journeys, which sometimes can be filled with suffering. And, and anyone who is out there trying to alleviate that should be lifted up and highly commended. And you've obviously done that at a scale that is uh, beyond compare. So uh, thank you so much and uh, hope you have a, a, a wonderful uh, a new year and, and much success with the new book. Same to you, Bob. Very privileged to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know.